Hi, I'm Steve Halliday, and this is our next video on Raspberry Pi bare metal programming. In this video, we're going to explore data statements and figure out how to write a complete Hello World program. In the previous video, you may recall that we wrote a Hi World, or a Hi program. That's because writing Hi was fairly tedious. But we're going to introduce data statements in this video, which will make it a little bit easier to write lengthier strings. Our previous code example looks something like this. There was an initialization section, which I haven't bothered to copy in here, but the initialization section would basically be the same as in the previous video. And we notice here that what we're doing is we're loading in an, uh, an ASCII H character here into register 2, and then we write that character out. Here we write an I character with these two lines, and then finally we write a space character, and we sit in this loop writing high over and over and over again. Now, one of the things you may not have noticed in the programs that I've shown you so far is that all the data in these programs is embedded in the instructions. In other words, this 48, which is really data, is actually part of the instruction code. And we haven't actually split out the data from the program. In this video, we're going to do exactly that. Here's the pseudocode for the program that we're going to write in this segment that prints out hello over and over again. I haven't given you the actual code because that would take away some of the challenge and as one of my students once said, that's not the cowboy way. But this is basically how it works. What we'll do is we'll set aside some data to contain the string H-E-L-L-O and we'll use a register to point at the address in memory that holds that data. And so this first pseudocode instruction basically says to load that register with the address of the data. Then, in this next line here, we go out and we get the character that the data register is pointing at. If that character is a zero, we're going to branch out of the loop. What this means is I've used the C or C++ convention of terminating my characters with a null byte so that I can tell where the end of the string is. And so when I hit this byte, I want to branch out of the loop down here. If it's not a null byte, then I go ahead and output the character. I increment the pointer in the address to point the next character, and then I branch back to this inner loop. And so this inner loop is printing out characters until finally I hit the null character. Then I come down here, I delay for a while, and then I branch back up to the main loop and start over printing out hello again. Now the one mystery in this pseudocode is this delay right here. I found that I need to put this delay in here to make the program work. I can't tell you why. I don't understand what the problem is here, but I know if I don't put this delay in, the bits in my byte get shifted over. They get shifted over by the number of leading zeros in the first byte that gets sent out. So for example, in the character H or hello, it's a 48 hex, which means that the two high order bits are set to zero. And as the program runs, my bytes get shifted over by two bits. I can't explain why this is. When I used a character that had only one zero for its high order bit, the bytes got shifted by one. If I used a character with a leading one in the high order bit, the rest of the bytes didn't get shifted at all. So I don't quite understand what's going on here. If somebody can point out what my problem is and help me figure out how to solve this, I suspect it's something in the way that I'm initializing the UART. I did the initialization exactly the same way as I did in the previous video. So I'd like to remove this delay, but I can't figure out how to do so. So if anybody can tell me how to fix that, I'd be more than happy to take your advice on that. One other aspect of the programs that we've written up till now is that all addresses that we've used have been relative to wherever our current program counter is. So for example, when we would branch to a loop, we would branch relative to this location. And when we would call a method such as delay or write ch, the branch would be relative to the current program counter. But that's not going to work really well for us going forward all the time. So we need to come up with another way to be able to address this. So before we can explain this new approach, I need to explain one more thing. You'll remember that when we looked at the boot sequence for the Raspberry Pi, I told you that the kernel.img file gets loaded at location 8000 hex. What we'd really like to do is be able to control all of the memory image. And so we'd like to load the kernel.img file at location 0 
and go forward from there. The way that we cause the GPU to load the kernel.img file at location 0 is to add this one line into our config.txt file that is on our SD card for the Raspberry Pi. So this kernel.old, evidently the GPU sees this in the config.txt file and loads our kernel at location 0 in memory. Evidently the old kernels were loaded at location 0. Now they load them at location 8000. There's a few reasons for that. One reason is that location 0 is where the interrupt vectors reside and we'll talk more about the interrupt vectors in the next video. I'll just touch about that briefly now. Uh, additionally, the GPU when it boots the Raspberry Pi, it puts some information. I think it's at address 100 hex in memory. It puts some information about the Raspberry Pi. This information is called A tags and it contains things like how much memory the Raspberry Pi is configured to use and, and some other things like that. And I won't get into the A tags, but you can look those up online and find out about the format for those. And then additionally, you may want to have some room for your stack and so forth. And so just to be safe, the GPU started loading the code at location 8000 hex instead of at location 0. But this is how we can change that. There are four different types of data statements that we'll build into our assembler that'll help us with these different problems. And I'll touch on each of these and explain them to you. The first one is called a byte data statement. What the byte data statement does is it reserves a single byte in memory and gives it a specific value. And here's an example of how we might use it. Here's the byte statement down here. Here I'm actually reserving several bytes, but it works the same way. I have the word byte, and then I have the value that it's equal to. I can omit initializing the byte if I just want to leave an empty byte for whatever reason. I could do that. And if I want to initialize it, then I can give it a value. If I give it multiple values separated by commas, then that gives me a sequence of bytes in memory with these different values associated with them. This value right here is the value of a ASCII capital H, E, L, L, O, and then the null terminator. So you can see that this would be a hello string. Up here, I'm showing how I would move immediate hello. Hello is a label, just like we used in the labels for our assembly language. So we can use a label here as well, which is the address of this first byte. So we're moving that address into register 4. Then we move into register 2, what register 4 is pointing at. And we branch to the right character to output the character that's in register 2. So this gives us an idea of how we would print out a string of bytes that are stored in data and memory. And we put this into a loop and basically we would print out the whole string. The next data statement is the word data statement. It's a lot like the byte data statement, except instead of reserving a single byte, it reserves an entire word or four bytes. Here's an example. You'll see that I'm using the word data statement down here and I'm initializing it to a 42. We could also initialize a sequence of words if we wanted to, but here I'm just initializing one word. And I've given it a label called count. In this example, this is the number of times that I want to go through a loop. So here's my example. I start by loading a zero into register six, and then I move into register five, the value at count. Now you'll notice that here I'm moving immediately. In other words, I'm moving a zero into register six, whereas here I'm moving not immediately, not the address of count in register five, but the thing that's at address of count in register 5. It's a little bit hard to keep these move and move immediate separate and I think I probably made some mistakes on the previous video but you get the general idea here and you can you can work through it. Here I'm comparing register 5 and register 6. In other words my counter which is in register 6 with the value of 42 which is in register 5 and if those are equal then I branch to loop out otherwise I add one to register 6 and I would branch back up to loop here. I didn't show that. I should have. But I would branch back up to loop and so I would go through this 42 times and then eventually I would break out and go to loop out here. The third data statement is the block data statement. This allows us to reserve a bunch of bytes. We can't initialize these bytes with any value 
but it allows us to reserve many bytes. So here's the example. Let's say I wanted to reserve 1K for my stack. So I'd say block 1024, which is 1K. I could use either decimal or hex for any of these numbers in here like I could anywhere else. They're just numbers in our assembler. And then up here, I could move into register 13, which remember is the stack pointer we talked about in the, one of the previous videos. I can move stack, which is the address of this 1024, this 1K of bytes. So I can move that into register 13. So this would be the way I did, that I would initialize a stack. The final data statement is the address data statement. It's a little different from the other three that we've looked at. The purpose of the address data statement is to tell us where our assembler should start putting code and data that it assembles. So you can look at this example here. I've used the address data statement here. I've said address equals 1000 hex. What this line does is it tells the assembler start putting whatever you find at location 1000 hex here in memory. So I would, in this example, be allocating 1K of bytes right here for my stack. Now, later on down in my assembly code, I might have another address statement that says start working at address 8000 hex, which would mean that this start section here would actually be down here now. And I could put code down here at location 8000 hex if I wanted. And then if I needed to jump back up for whatever reason, say I wanted to set my interrupt vector, I could put an address zero in here. This allows me to control where things get put in memory. So what my assembler is really going to do is it's going to create a big array of bytes, which represents the image of memory on the Raspberry Pi. And then if I use the trick that I showed earlier of setting kernel underscore old to one, this image gets loaded starting at address zero, and I can start to play with all the values in memory here. One of the concerns that some of my students have raised about these address data statements is that a programmer can shoot himself in the foot pretty easily by perhaps writing over code that he's already programmed or whatever. That's kind of the assembly way. It's a rough and tumble world in assembly land, and if a guy doesn't understand how to manage his memory and ends up writing over something he shouldn't, then that's just kind of part of life in the assembly world. So I don't think that we ought to put any special guardrails on our assemblers to prevent people from doing things that we think might not be wise because people may actually have a reason for doing whatever it is they're trying to do. And so we should give them full control over the hardware at this point. So that brings us to the end of our data statements video. This should arm you with enough information to be able to create a full kernel image starting at location zero using data statements to hold your data such as hello or hello world strings and then be able to print them out easily. I hope you enjoyed this video and that you're making progress on your assemblers and we look forward to working in the next video on some interrupts.